Well, thank you for your interest. Uh, I'm Diana Jerkins. I'm the moderator today. I'm with OF Organic Farming Research Foundation. And we have three very distinguished presenters today. Um, Aaron Hill from Michigan State, <clears throat> Aaron Silva from University of Wisconsin, and Rachel Well from University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to ask them to uh, identify themselves and give a little bio for themselves and then get straight into their presentation. Uh, they'll each present for about 20, 25 minutes. We'll open it up to a few questions and then go on to the next speaker. So, um, Erin? All right. Well, thank you, Diana. So, as she mentioned, I'm Erin Hill from Michigan State University. And the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is um, what I was working on for my PhD. And so I'm currently a research associate uh, still at Michigan State University. And we were interested in looking at cover crops and how they impact organic dry beans. And so just to begin, I want to tell you a little bit about dry beans. So these are kind of the regions where dry beans are grown throughout the United States. And so you see they're kind of in different pockets. And, and one of those pockets is is in Michigan. And uh, in the survey of organic agriculture, we saw that actually Michigan is the number one producer of organic dry beans, uh, with about 39% of the harvested acres being in our state alone. So when you look at Michigan, a lot of our dry bean production is going on in what we call the thumb area. And it extends a little bit also into mid-Michigan. And we grow several different classes of dry edible beans showing over here on the right. And, but our number, or our two top classes would be black beans and navy beans. And definitely when you're talking about organic production, I would say that primarily we're like talking about um, black beans. So a little more about, about dry bean production. Uh, the planting time is a little bit later than you would think of for corn or soybeans. We're looking at uh, June and sometimes into uh, mid-June or even sometimes a little bit later for the uh, organic producers. There's a variety of row spacings that people are using, but they usually vary between 15 and 30 inches. And then we have populations up over 100,000 seeds per acre. Most of our production in Michigan is rain-fed. And then another important point I want to point out or uh, tell you about is that the conventional producers of dry beans in the state are usually applying nitrogen at the time of planting about 40 pounds of nitrogen or more. And that's because even though this is a legume crop that does fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, it's not quite as efficient as a soybean plant. And, and so they give it a boost early on in the season. We're harvesting in late September or mid-October. So really, this is a short season crop compared to corn and soybeans coming in in June and coming out in September and October. And direct harvest uh, has become the most common method of harvest. And our conventional yields, as of 2013, were averaging 1,900 pounds per acre. So we wanted to look in an organic system at how cover crops are influ we're interested in how they're influencing nitrogen availability. So in an organic system where you can't put down the synthetic nitrogen, are cover crops contributing? Uh, we wanted to look at different driving characteristics and how the cover crops might be impacting those, looking at populations, nodulation, yield, maturity, those kinds of things. And then we also, since our primary focus and, and my small subgroup at Michigan State is weed science, we wanted to see if there was any impact of these cover crops on weed dynamics during the, the driving season. So as I said, this system is unique compared to corn and soybeans where maybe more research has been done because of the shorter growing season. So what does this mean when you're looking at cover crops? Well, if you're looking at a cover crop that winter kills, it means there's an extended window between the time that the cover crop dies and the time that we're planting the cash crop, the dry beans. So more time compared to other crops. When you're looking at an overwintering cover crop, that means that you have more time for that to grow and produce biomass in the spring compared to the other, other field crops. Also, at the time of planting, soil and air temperatures are warmer than some of the previously uh, conducted research. So I'm going to kind of rudimentarily walk you through the methods here. We looked at three different cover crops, and these were all monoculture cover crops, so just a single species. We were interested in looking at red clover, oilseed radish, and rye, and then we had a no cover control where there was some weed growth. So since we're looking at cover crops, this is really a two-year 
uh, process. In the first year, we're planting the cover crop, and in the second year, we're planting the dry beans. Now, to try and extend our window to look at these different cover crops, we were planting them either within or following a small grain. So the clover ideally was frost seeded, and then following small grain harvests like rye or oats, uh, we planted radish in August and rye in September. The radish, of course, winter killed. It doesn't uh, survive a typical Michigan winter. But the clover and rye are overwintering cover crops, and so they had to be terminated using uh, some form of tillage. We usually uh, chisel plow these a minimum of two weeks before planting the dry beans. In this study, we also looked at different dry bean classes. So we looked at black beans and navy beans and different varieties within these classes. But since we only have 20 minutes today, we're going to group all of the dry beans together. So now I want to talk about the timing of the different measurements. Remember, we're going to talk about nitrogen, we're going to talk about beans, and we're going to talk about weeds. So some of the measurements were taken before the dry bean growing season, during cover crop uh, biomass production. Some of them were taken at the time of dry bean planting in June. And then the, the remaining uh, timings were based on the development of the dry beans. So we had some taken around two weeks into the season when there were two trifoliates, or we call that V2, uh, R1, which is when we had the first flowers, R5, the first full pod, and then at harvest. So for something like nitrogen, where we want to see uh, how much nitrogen, and we're talking about ammonium and nitrate, um, how much is available in the soil at these different times of year, we're actually we're looking at that at all of these different timings. And the, the preseason one would have been taken in the fall, usually in early November. When we're looking at the different driving attributes, it's a little messier here, but we were looking at driving population. So how many drivings emerged two weeks into the season at V2, and then we were also looking at that again at harvest. We were looking at the number of nodules produced on the drivings. That was at V2 and at that first flower stage, R1. We uh, decided to rate maturity prior to harvest. And then at harvest time, we were, of course, looking at yield. And then the amount of nitrogen that was within the beans that we harvested. Then finally, looking at weeds, we looked at weeds a few different times in a few different ways. We looked at how many weeds were present in the spring when the, when the cover crop was there or had been there, so at the time of uh, tillage. We also looked at the weeds growing uh, while the dry beans were growing. And we looked at those at that V2 and R1 stage. And the significance of these two stages is that typically after V2, after we have two trifoliates, growers switch from more rigorous early season cultivation methods like using a rotary hoe or a tine weeder to something that targets really the weeds between the rows, such as an inner row cultivator. So that's why we were looking at the weeds at those two different times. And when we're looking at those weeds in the season, you can see here on the bottom right that uh, we're really targeting our weed counts and our weed biomass just directly over that row because the cultivator takes out most of the weeds between the rows. And then the final thing that we I will just touch on is we also wanted to look at how cover crops can impact weed seed mortality. So when the seed uh, stage of the life cycle is in the soil, do cover crop crops have any impact on, on those, do they increase mortality? And to do that, we used a bag study, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, where we put cover crop biomass in with a known number of weed seeds from different species and pulled those out over time to see what remained. So today, I am just going to talk about the really high cover crop biomass locations, which happen to be the ones that were on our ag experiment station um, sites. And those were ones where we were able to follow that planting diagram to a T, so we maximized the amount of biomass from these cover crops. So we had two of those sites, um, one in East Lansing and one um, down at the Kellogg Biological Station in Hickory Corners. And for each of those sites, we did this study for three driving growing seasons, so six site years altogether. Uh, we also had on-farm sites that I'm not going to talk about today, and usually those had a lot lower biomass production. And I'm kind of showing that down here in the table, uh, looking at our average biomass, and then I give you kind of a percent uh, reduction, I guess, of what we saw on the on-farm sites. And a lot of that had to do with planting time and a little bit different management. They also sometimes were in different rotations. But we're going to talk today about what happens when you have – 
you know, sort of maximize your cover crop biomass. So now I'm going to walk through this sort of by cover crop and try to cover a lot of data in a short amount of time. And hopefully I will be successful at doing that. So first, looking at oilseed radish, uh, looking at the nitrogen availability in the soil. Remember I said we looked at this in the fall. And we're always comparing this to our no cover control where we did have some weed growth, but we did not intentionally plant a cover crop. And what we saw was that uh, the majority of the time when we had oilseed radish growing in the fall, there was less soil nitrogen uh, sitting there that would be leached out potentially over the winter when we compared it to the no cover control. So the, the radish was doing a really good job of taking up that nitrogen and then, you know, potentially uh, saving it for the crop or saving it for next year. When we came time to look at how much nitrogen was available to the dry beans during the season, for the most part, at most of the sampling times, it was the same as having no cover crop at all. But we did see sort of at a couple of those six site years, there was an increase two weeks into the season of available nitrogen for the beans. And this was really curious for us and something that we, we want to continue to look at because Remember, this is the winter killed cover crop, the crop that died six months before the dry beans were planted. So how is the nitrogen becoming available two weeks into the, the growing season? So we have some questions that we want to follow up on for this. And so this is really just a graph. I'll have a couple of these throughout the presentation showing the um, total inorganic, so nitrate and ammonium soil nitrogen that was available. And at this particular site in 2013, um, you can see that the orange bar here, which is the radish, did have about 11 pounds uh, more nitrogen available than the gray bar, which is the no-cover crop. So now looking at how did oilseed radish impact driving characteristics? And I promise these will get more interesting as we go along, but I'm going to have tables that are set up like this where I have the attributes we looked at on the left-hand side and then, you know, how radish impacted them or the other cover crops. Green means that it had a positive impact. Red, you don't see any here, but we'll mean that it had a negative impact. So for radish, uh, really, it was pretty neutral. This is all compared to that no cover control again. So when we look at nodulation, maturity, yield, and uh, grain nitrogen content, it, uh, radish was pretty neutral. It wasn't uh, positively impacting the beans. It wasn't negatively impacting them. Um, we did see in one of the six years that there were increased uh, bean populations, but that didn't end up translating into more yield. So now looking at the third area, the weed dynamics, and how did oilseed radish impact that? Again, you see no color on this table. So it's pretty neutral. Um, with regard to spring weed biomass, remember the radish has died. Sometimes we still saw uh, weeds that were equivalent to our no cover. So there were still weeds in the spring when we incorporated all of our cover crops before dry bean planting. During the season, though, no effect on weed number or biomass. And for this particular cover crop, we didn't look at the weed seed mortality. Okay, so moving on to cereal rye. Remember, I promised this would get a little more interesting. So in the fall, we did see that sometimes the rye was taking up more nitrogen than the no cover, but the majority of the time it was pretty much the same. Remember, rye is kind of small in the fall. It really puts on its biomass in the spring. So though it was uh, taking some nitrogen out of the soil profile, it, it wasn't always more effective than the no cover weeds. Now with rye, we saw, remember, this is very large rye. These are the high biomass site years. So sometimes this is rye that is almost as tall as I am at the time of incorporation. Uh, we saw that, that that large rye had the potential to reduce nitrogen availability to the dry beans, which would be detrimental, right? And, and we saw this both at planting and at V2, so about two weeks in. And, and the range of reduction was up to about 13 uh, pounds of nitrogen less than the no cover uh, plots. And so this is another graph showing in 2013 at the MSU location, the reduction, the rye here is in the green bars. Comparing that to the no cover uh, gray bars, you can see that we had between 7 and 14 pounds of nitrogen less available for the, the dry beans. Now looking at the driving characteristics, Again, in one of the six years, we saw that there were more beans that came up following rye. 
that may have had something to do with soil moisture, the, the rye having kind of a mulching effect in that year, but it was, it was really an anomaly when you look at all of the site years. Uh, what stands out here is that you have some red boxes when you look at bean maturity and bean yield. And so we noticed, and this is why we decided to rate maturity, that some of the plots where there had been rye, the beans were drying down faster. They were losing their leaves faster. So about a third of the time we, we observed this, that they were, the beans appeared to be stressed out, and so they were senescing earlier. So that could be related to the lack of nitrogen um, compared to no cover. Um, that would be detrimental. And then when it came to bean yield, this was only in one of six site years, but it was when we had the most rye biomass, we did see a reduction in dry bean yield. And I'm showing that here. This was in 2011. Uh, we saw a 38% yield reduction when we had that really monstrous uh, rye cover crop. So that's something that growers need to be aware of. Rye right now is the cover crop that is used before dry beans probably the most because they can plant it following corn. And so if we have a wet spring and we're going to have a potentially high biomass, I mean, this is, this is a potential risk of using cereal rye. Now looking at the weeds from the weed standpoint, um, really in the spring that rye cover crop was really robust, so we didn't see much as far as a spring weed biomass. So maybe not getting uh, many weed seeds put into the seed bank that will be developing alongside the rye, so that's good. Um, but we didn't see an impact uh, on weed number or the weed biomass during the dry bean growing season. It, the weeds there were very similar to the no cover control. Then when we looked at that bag study where we looked at putting rye in with weed seeds in with sand and burying them and pulling them up at different times of year, we saw that weed seed mortality was reduced half of the time for velvet leaf and for giant foxtail. And so what that means is that the seed viability or longevity was increased. These weed seeds would persist longer. And this probably has to do with this high seed to N ratio, maybe decreased microbial activity. So these seeds, and again, I have this asterisk up here to remind you, this is a really high rate, a high microsite probably, where there's a lot of rye next to these weed seeds, it's a potential to increase the longevity of the weed seeds. Okay, so moving on to our last cover crop, which is medium red clover, and looking at nitrogen availability. Uh, this is the only legume that we looked at, right? So we expected big things from uh, medium red clover, and we did see some of them. So starting out, though, looking at the soil nitrogen in the fall, the clover, um, it, it didn't really take up as much nitrogen as the radish and the no cover. It only performed better than that about a third of the time. So maybe it's reducing the amount of residual nitrogen, um, but not consistently. And what I will say, though, is that uh, these are really low nitrogen systems. We're not putting any additional nitrogen in. We're not putting manure in or anything like that. So we're already at a really low level. If this were a conventional system and maybe there was some nitrogen, residual nitrogen from the previous crop, maybe we would see a bigger difference. But in this system, we did not. Now when it came to the nitrogen available during the dry bean growing season, we did see an increase um, in, in available nitrogen, which makes sense. This is a legume. It has a lower C to N ratio. It had a lot of nitrogen available per unit of biomass uh, compared to the other cover crops. And so 100% of the time when we were able to frost seed the clover into that small green and have a really lush, robust clover cover crop, we had more, more nitrogen. And, and four out of five times we had that like two weeks into the season. And the, the values ranged here from having 12 pounds of nitrogen more per acre to up to 50 pounds more nitrogen per acre. And that's something that growers always ask about because they want to know how much nitrogen credit they can get from a, a clover cover crop. But you can see it's, it varies from year to year. So this is, again, my uh, nitrogen graph. And at this particular site, we saw an increase in nitrogen, not just at planting it, and at V2, but into flowering and into pod development, we still saw that these clover plots had more nitrogen. So we were pretty excited about that. But then when we started looking at the uh, dry bean characteristics, um, you know, it didn't pan out 
kind of how we thought that it would. So when we looked at nodulation, we saw that following a clover cover crop at that flowering time, there were actually reduced number of nodules on the, on the driving plants. And when you look at using synthetic nitrogen on a legume, you can see this too because they don't need to rely on that fixation as much as they do um, in the absence of, of nitrogen. When we looked at bean maturity, uh, remember it was negative for rye, it was also negative for clover, but kind of in the opposite way. The maturity of the beans was actually delayed in clover. Um, and we didn't measure the amount of uh, biomass of the beans. I mean, we looked at yield and we looked at grain M, but we didn't look at biomass. So perhaps some of that nitrogen was in the vegetative biomass and it was delaying maturity. And this could be a problem if we have an early frost and, and the crop is not ready and the frost comes. When we looked at yield, though, this increase in the amount of nitrogen available didn't result in higher yield compared to no cover. But we were excited to find that the nitrogen was actually higher when you looked at how much nitrogen was in the actual product at the end, in the actual bean. And so we saw in four of our six site years that, that there was more following the clover. And so this increased nitrogen in the grain would, would end up being more protein in the beans. And so this might be something that becomes important uh, later on. So this is just a, a figure showing that there are increases in grain nitrogen uh, were up to 32% higher than the no cover uh, crop treatment. So then we looked at the weed dynamics for the clover here and for the spring biomass, if we were able to frost seed that clover and have a robust stand, we really didn't see a lot of spring weeds. But when we looked at the weeds during the season, we saw that you know, half the time or close to half the time there were more weeds following clover and there were bigger weeds following clover. And so part of that could be explained from that nitrogen. The nitrogen is there and maybe the beans aren't using it efficiently. Um, but it could also be explained maybe by the management system. So the clover had been there for a very long time compared to the other cover crops. There was less tillage in those treatments. And also, uh, sometimes I think that there was the possibility to have some fall uh, weed seed inputs growing within the clover, particularly giant foxtail. There was the potential to have that. Um, when it came to seed mortality, we did see in one of the two years that we looked at that, that it increased the mortality of uh, common lamb squirters. So that would be a good thing. So this lower C to N ratio cover crop at a high rate uh, may have had a really active microbial community that reduced the viability of the weed seed. And this was, I was going to show you just an example of the difference between frost seeding here on the right, you have a robust stand with no weeds in the spring, and if you didn't plant until the summer, on the left here, you ended up with a lot of winter annual weeds when it came springtime to incorporate. This picture here is showing sort of that in-season increase in weed number and weed biomass. In this particular year, in 2012, you could pick out to the plot line where the clover plot was because of the increased uh, common lamb squirters. And common lamb squirters is a weed that really responds to nitrogen. The more ni It's a really nitrogen-loving weed. But it was pretty amazing to just walk down and say, yeah, that was a clover plot. Um, that's kind of where it started its stop. So this is pulling it all together, all of the cover crops, and some of the uh, most notable attributes that we looked at. You see again that the oilseed radish was relatively neutral compared to no cover crop. Um, and sometimes we did have that sort of mysterious increase in, in soil nitrogen during the driving season that we want to look at. Cereal rye, which is currently the most commonly used cover crop before drybeans, we saw the potential for decreased soil nitrogen availability, uh, decreased days to to maturity, and on that one occasion we saw reduced uh, yields. And then when it came to clover, you know, it's kind of a mix. You had more soil nitrogen, you ended up with more nitrogen in the grain, but you also had the potential to delay maturity and the potential to really increase your weed community, which in an organic system in particular might be uh, something hard to deal with. So I'm wrapping up here with my tips for improved performance of these cover crops before dry beans. Uh, the oilseed radish, I think that the planting time is going to be really critical. So here we're planting in mid-August, so we can get a really lush, 
stand of uh, radish, which will help outcompete fall weeds. And I talked about these different areas of production, but I didn't talk about what soil quality benefits we might be getting. So even though radish appeared to be relatively neutral in the areas I looked at, there might be some other benefits that I didn't measure. For cereal rye, I think termination timing is really critical. Our ideal termination time for this project would have been when it was 18 inches tall, and I think a lot of the growers were able to achieve that. But when we get rain, it's kind of unpredictable, and we're relying on a chisel plow for termination, that really can put a kink in the chain uh, for terminating it. And that's why it can go from 18 inches up to almost as tall as I am in very little amount of time. So we want to try the best we can to target this, this termination height of 18 inches. And we really need to look at a decision tree for organic growers to say, what are you going to do when it gets out of control? Will mowing help? Are there other ways that you can treat this? Um, but that's something that we still need to understand. And then uh, terminating it at least two weeks ahead of time will help avoid other issues that we didn't talk about. Allelopathy would be one of them. Um, and then also the seed corn maggot. We saw this in one of our on-farm trials uh, just in one of the years, but they actually, things got you know, kind of busy and they didn't incorporate the rye until the day that they planted the dry beans. So when we went back to take our measurements two weeks into the season, we saw areas where there were you know, a nice stand of beans, and then we saw areas where there were all these beans missing, and it was in the rye plot, and it's because that rotting residue attracted the, um, uh, the pest, and it ended up eating the, the beans and reduced the population. So that's another caution to think about. Uh, and then for medium red clover, I think if you have a really lush stand of clover, you might want to think about terminating it earlier because uh, it can result in those detriments that we saw. And maybe clover just isn't a good fit for dry beans. Maybe clover needs to be before a crop that's more competitive for nitrogen, like corn, right, that can outcompete the weeds for the nitrogen. So maybe it's just at this point not the best fit. And then but the other flip side of that is we saw that it increased the nitrogen, it increased the protein content of the beans. So if there is a market added value down the road for this, for having beans with higher protein content, then maybe we need to revisit clover and figure out how to make it more manageable for organic growers. So with that, um, I just have my funding source to thank, which was uh, the OREI, and then the, the driving growers that I worked with, and then the people managing the experiment stations. I don't know if we have any time for questions or not. We do? Anybody? Is it? Yes, someone. Questions for a thorough, ex thorough explanation. We thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, remember, this is going out on the web, so that's why we need to use the mic. Do you think a combination of cover crops might help you maximize your benefits? I think that's very possible. I know that there are lots of people looking at mixes of cover crops. Um, I think, though, that we need to go back and do some uh, preliminary work that maybe has been skipped over, looking at how these cover crops can create a synergy. I think that sometimes when we're deciding in the mixes what ratio to use uh, of the various species, that we don't really have a, the best understanding at this time of what the, the best ratios would be. So. Um, that's an area that I, I'm interested in looking at. I know there are people using mixes all over the place, but I think maybe we missed some of the early work to figure out what mixes and what ratios might be best. Hi. Um, you mentioned either once or twice the dry beans not needing to rely on their fixed nitrogen as much. I was wondering if there's any evidence of nodules adjusting their rate of fixation based on the quantity of external nitrogen in the soil? Um, I think there is, uh, there is some data out there that shows that, yeah, when there is the nitrogen in the soil, they don't need to rely on it. But it might not just be the number that we measured. It might also be the activity of the actual nodules that were there. So this was just kind of our very simplistic approach at trying to look at nitrogen fixation. I will say we did look at the grain at the end of the season to look at the percent of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, and there were no differences across these cover crops. So we tried to look at that, but somebody who is really looking at bean physiology more um, probably would be able to tease it all apart a little better than we did. <laughs>